Hi and welcome. My name is Julianne Cost, and in the next few minutes, we're going to take a look at how to convert images to black and white, how to add a sepia tone or a color overlay, edge effects, as well as grain. So let's go ahead and get started. I've got this image here in the develop module, and the first thing that I can do to convert it to black and white is to tap the V key, or I can click on the basic panel and click the treatment black and white. That's going to convert the image to black and white, but if we want more control, we should scroll down to this HSL color and black and white panel. Be sure to click where it says black and white, because if you click on HSL or color, it'll convert the file back to color. So we'll click on black and white, and you can see the auto mix that Lightroom has used to convert the image from color into grayscale. Now, just like the HSL had a targeted adjustment tool, so does the black and white. If I click on it to select it, and then position it on top of my image, whatever color I click on, when I drag the cursor up, it will lighten that color, and when I drag the cursor down, it will darken it. So here I have it positioned over the red color in the original image, and I'll click and drag down in order to darken that color range, or I can click and drag up in order to lighten that color range. In fact, I can even find kind of a medium point here where it almost looks like that wall was all one solid color to begin with. But of course, if I tap the Y key, you can see that indeed it was painted a very different color. So that's an excellent way to convert an image to grayscale. But another effect that a lot of photographers like is when almost all of the image is grayscale, except for a little portion of it. So let's go back to color by clicking the HSL, and I'm going to change the saturation sliders to negative 100 in order to take out all of the saturation from this image. But remember, all of these global changes that I'm making are non-destructive. So even though the image now looks as if it's in grayscale, I can move over to my adjustment brush and load my adjustment brush with a positive amount of saturation and then click and paint, and I can actually paint back in the color from the original image. So that's a great way, for example, if you've got a bride and she's holding the flowers and you want to convert everything to grayscale except for the bouquet. That's a great technique for doing that. Now at this point, you might decide that you don't want the entire background in grayscale, so let's go ahead and scroll back down to HSL, and don't forget, you can always bring back or reintroduce a little bit of color by using these sliders. And maybe it's the blue that you want, but not the red. So we could grab our targeted adjustment tool and click and drag to reduce the red more, just so that we get a little more contrast and this stands out. Okay, let's move to another image. We'll go back to the image of the horse here. And let's say that we want to create a sepia tone version. Well. I might like the version that I have right now, so I may not want to make changes to this thumbnail, but what I'd like to do is create what's called a virtual copy. And what that is, is it's a secondary thumbnail that Lightroom will create for the same original file on disk. So I'm not taking up any more space on my hard drive by making this virtual copy. I'm just telling Lightroom to display a secondary thumbnail to which I can apply different settings. So how do we make this virtual copy? Easiest way is to go under Photo and then Create Virtual Copy, or use the keyboard shortcut Command Apostrophe or Control Apostrophe on Windows. You can see down here in my film strip that there are now two thumbnails for this image. So again, I'll tap the V key, which is going to convert this image to grayscale. If I wanted to go in and make modifications, I could do so right here with the black and white mix. For now, I'm going to move directly to split toning because I want to create a sepia toned image. Now, if the goal is to replicate a traditional sepia tone, then you want to make sure that you're adding the color down in your shadow areas. If the goal were to be to make something like an antique photo, then you want to add the color into your highlights. Let me show you the difference. I'm going to move the saturation slider over but you can see that I've got the wrong hue selected. So now I can just scoot that over to get a nice sepia color, and then if I dialed in too much at first, we can just back off a little on that. That's very different from adding color into the highlights. 
This time what I'm going to do is use a little bit of a keyboard shortcut. I'm going to hold down the Option key or the Alt key on Windows and drag the hue so that I can pick the color that I want. In this case I want a yellow color. Then I'll let go of the keyboard shortcut and then dial in the saturation that I want. You can see that the color is being displayed in the highlight area, which would be the same as a faded piece of paper, right? The, the paper itself is going to color, so the yellow would be shown in the areas where there's no black. So, another thing that you can do is you can add two different colors, one color in your shadows and one color in your highlights, and get kind of a cross-process effect. So, for example, I could move my hue over for my shadows to something like cyan and bring in some saturation. And then I can leave my highlights set to yellow and increase the saturation there. Now, if I wanted to change kind of the midtone of where these colors cross over, that's when I use the balance slider. Moving it to the left will show me more of the blue from the shadow, and moving it to the right will show me more of the yellow from the highlights. So it's just a personal choice as far as what colors you like. Next, I want to add an effect, so I'm going to display the effects panel and I want to add a post-crop vignette. I'll go ahead and set the style to color priority because it's a little bit more subtle, and then increase the amount. I'll go ahead and increase that a little too strong for now just to make sure that we can see what the other sliders do. The midpoint is going to bring the vignette in towards the center or out towards only the edges. The roundness slider will make it a more of a rectangular effect. Let's bring the midpoint back up so we can see that or we can move it to the right to get a more circular effect. The feather is going to give you either a hard edge vignette or a soft edge vignette. I'm going to go ahead and set the amount way down. I'll put the midpoint more towards the center, bring the roundness to the left so it's more of a rectangular effect, and make sure that the feather amount is high so that we don't see a, a harsh transition between where the vignette starts and ends. I can also add grain to my image. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit here, and then we'll increase the amount of grain. So you can see the grain that Lightroom creates and introduces into the image is really a very natural looking grain. We can adjust the size of that grain if we want to, making it larger or making it smaller, and we can also adjust the roughness of the grain, which gives more of a kind of a harsher, more contrasty look as we move it to the right. The thing with adding grain in Lightroom is that, well, at least for me, it took a few tries as far as how much to apply versus how much I would get when I print. So it might take a little bit of experimentation till you get the right combination. But let's say that we absolutely love what we've done to this image and we want to apply it to multiple images. Well, the easiest way to do that would simply be to select those other images down here in the film strip like we've done before, click the Synchronize button, and then in this case, let's make sure that we know what we're synchronizing, so I'll check None, and then I'm going to turn on the black and white treatment and the black and white mix, the split toning, and then the effects, which will include the post-crop vignetting and the grain, and then I'll click Synchronize to apply all of those effects to these other two images. So it's very easy to apply effects from one image to another image if they're in the same collection. But what if I want to kind of save this effect because I think I might want to use it next week or next month? Then what I need to do is create what's called a preset. There are two theories behind how to build a preset. Uh, some photographers like to save as many settings as they can in a single preset, and other photographers just want to save like a single setting, like a vignette, so that they can kind of mix and match, like maybe a sepia tone with a dark vignette or a dark vignette with a cyanotype. And with some of those, they might want to mix in grain and sometimes not. So they might not include all of these settings as a single preset, but make individual ones instead. Let me show you what I mean. For example, I have a set of presets that are just post-crop vignetting. And you can see when I hover over each one of the presets, we get a preview above in the navigator. So here are two of kind of the mimics of the Instagram look, just that solid um, kind of retro vignette. Then I've got some here that just darken the vignettes a different amount. So 
By clicking on one of these presets, the only change I'm going to get to my image is the vignette. It would never change the color, it would never add the grain, because I've saved my post crop vignette preset as its own single change. Likewise, my single color split toning does the same thing. If we scroll down a little bit, you can see what my image would look like if I click on the cyan, or the green, or the magenta option here. So, when I click on this, it's not going to change the vignette because I didn't save that with the preset. So how do we save this preset? Well, at the top where it says presets, we click on the plus icon, and then we can create a new folder or we can save a preset into a folder that already exists. In this case, let's just save this into my user presets. And let's name this CP for cross process, and you'll notice that it is a kind of cyan yellow color. It has a vignette on it, so I'll type V, and it also has that grain applied, so I'll type G. So, I mean, this might seem very cryptic to you, but you just need to name it whatever you'll remember. So if we wanted to go ahead and save all of those settings together as one preset, we would just make sure that all of those settings are checked here, and then we could click Create. If, on the other hand, we wanted to create a preset that only had one of those values saved, for example, maybe only the cross process to cyan yellow, then we would go ahead and turn off the effects, but I probably want to leave on the black and white um, treatment options here because most of the time I would want to add the split tone effect to a grayscale image. I don't want to add the split tone on top of the color that's already there. So then we could go ahead and click Create. And now let's take a look at the difference. Let's move back to the barber image for a minute, and you can see if I simply click this first preset, all it's going to do is convert the image to grayscale and add the cross process. But if I click on the next image down, it also added the grain as well as the vignette. I'll wrap it up with just one little shortcut. You might have noticed here that at the very top of all of my folders that are filled with presets, I have like a reset preset so that I can always get back to where I was in that folder full of presets. So for example, if I click on this reset, you'll notice that, that it reset all of my single color split toning. So if you want to know how to make that, it's actually very, very easy. All I did was I went to my split toning panel and just set all of the sliders here to zero. Well, I didn't set the hue to zero, but it doesn't matter because if the saturation is set to zero, then there's no color being added. So all you have to do is set the sliders at their defaults, click up here on the preset icon on the plus, and just save those settings, and that becomes your reset preset. Excellent. My name's Julianne Cost. Thanks for watching.